Good evening, everybody. Glad to have you all here this afternoon. Uh, we're going to get a little bit started here, kind of get everything, getting everybody started, getting things going. Tonight, I want to welcome you all to the Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center here at the Heartland Institute. I'm the Lenny Jarrett. I'm the project manager for education transformation here. So everything on your table that you have there, there's a couple of copies of the rewards book. If you know any teachers in private school, public school, and you want more copies, let me know. I'll be, I'll be glad to get you more copies to take to other teachers. Our school reform newspaper that's sitting there, make sure you take a copy. If you don't receive that, you can receive the physical copy or you can receive it digitally. It's up to you. And you'll see a couple of common core cards there. One of them is shows a third grade math problem. And the other one's my business card. So if you have any questions or have any groups, other groups you want somebody to come speak to, call me up and we'll work out trying to get a speaker and stuff there for you. Heartland Institute is a 32 year old think tank. We're a national organization, but our focus is really on state policy. We have five centers that we work with, budget and taxes, Consumer Healthcare Choices, Center on Climate and Environment Policy. The newest one is Constitutional Reform, Reform, and in my opinion, the most important is Education Transformation. So if we want to fix our country, the only way to fix it is to fix our education system because that's, that's our biggest problem right now we have. We also want to be thankful for our donors and the family of Andrew Breitbart who donated money and allowed us to use Andrew Breitbart's name and de in memory of Andrew here. Andrew was a true champion of, of freedom and liberty, and he didn't care who he stood up to. He was never afraid to just go right to the belly of the beast and start talking about liberty and freedom. And it's very fitting that we use his name in our Freedom Center here. Also on your table, I wanted to quick one thing. There's a sign-up sheet there. Some of you got our emails already to find out about this event. Some of you may have got a mailer. If you want to continually get updates on our events, please fill out that list. If you want to join the Heartland Institute and become a donor, just fill out those forms and we'll be glad to have your help and support as we fight for freedom and liberty across the entire country. There's an event here basically every single Wednesday night right now. So there's dinners, development dinners, there's other programs coming up. One thing I'll mention real quick is the next education event is June 8th, and it will be on education savings accounts, scholarship tax credits, and how to basically fund educational choice. So I want to make sure, plug to that. <laughs> so tonight though, we have Peter Wood, his book, Drilling Through the Core. It will be in the back if anybody wants a signed copy for $10 when the event is over, be welcome to go back there and Peter will sign your book for you. We'll also have time to answer Peter to answer questions for you. He'll give his talk. And so feel free as you're listening, if you think of a question that didn't get answered or something you want to know, write it down. There's pens on your table and be prepared to ask those questions when his talk is over. Common Core is basically you know, a top-down approach to education control. Peter Wood is the executive director of the president of the National Association of Scholars, which is a membership organization. So if you want to join the National Association of Scholars, Scholars, I know we had one member over here who said he was a member up until last year. If anybody else wants to become a member, talk to Peter. <laughs> yeah, Peter's going to talk to you afterwards. So. <laughs> yeah. Peter is an anthropologist and former provost. He was appointed president of the National Association of Scholars in January 2009. Before that, he was um, NES's executive director and the provost of the King's College in New York City. He's also the author of A Bee in the Mouth, Anger in American Now, and Diversity, the Invention of a Concept. In addition to his scholarly work, Peter has published hundreds of article, articles in print and online journals, including Partisan Review, National Review Online, and the Chronicles of Higher Education. And remember, after, take notes and be ready to ask, answer questions. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Peter Wood to the stage.
Thank you, Lenny. I'm delighted to be here. The Heartland Institute's an organization that has uh, worked with the National Association of Scholars on global warming, climate change, uh, the issue of sustainability, which I'm not talking about tonight, but I have a long relationship with Heartland, and I'm just delighted to have this opportunity to see them in their new headquarters here, which is a beautiful building. Um, the National Association of Scholars, short advertisement, is a 30-year-old organization made up originally and now mainly of uh, college professors who have uh, essentially taken the stand that to defend what is really valuable in higher education and in our civilization and in our civic culture in this country, we need an organized pushback against the politicization of our colleges and universities. And that's what we do, and we do it on many fronts, which meant in part that I had to be dragged kind of kicking and screaming into the Common Core, which is a K-12 thing. But eventually I saw that what was happening in K-12 was going to affect what goes on in colleges and universities, and I really couldn't sit on the sidelines. So with the help of the Pioneer Institute, the publisher of Drilling Through the Core, uh, we pulled together a team of experts on various aspects of the core, and I wrote about a 100-page introduction to this, which you have as available tonight. Now, the Common Core. Uh, you come out on this uh, cold, rainy spring day in Chicago to hear uh, a kind of mm, uh, sermon on the death of this uh, thing. The Common Core is by common consent dead, but don't leave just yet. As anyone who has watched a zombie movie knows, dead things can hurt us. <laughs> Even in the real world, discredited economic theories can come shambling back like Bernie Sanders' socialism. <laughs> 25 years after the Soviet Union was finally and unceremoniously buried, but here it is, incompetent models of catastrophic man-made global warming can linger long after they have been interred in the graveyard of cold data that contradicts them flatly, but still they're out there. Other terrifying fantasies conjured out of thin air for the sake of advancing the influence of some special interest continue to haunt many people no matter how thoroughly they have been debunked. America is a rape culture. Americans are in a rush to persecute Muslims. Opposition to liberal policies is based on hatred of minorities. How many times have you heard those? zombies. A dead idea or a dead policy isn't always just dead and gone. Sometimes it stays around just to be annoying or worse. Ask Jeb Bush if the death of the Common Core was neat and tidy. If it had died, say, two years earlier, his presidential campaign might still be alive. The dead sometimes take the living with them. In some cases, that may be all for the better, but sometimes it's genuinely tragic. Just a few days ago, Amtrak 89, a train I take from New York to Washington, D.C. on occasion, collided with a backhoe and killed two men. One of them happened to be a pedestrian who was trying to rescue the backhoe operator. The Common Core falls somewhere between the comedy of people with false ideas of their own importance, I won't mention names, and the tragedy of rescues that go terribly awry. But it has elements of both those things. When the Common Core was first conjured, which was less than a decade ago, it was meant to be a rescue plan. Its first architects, David Coleman and Jason Zimba, presented it as a solution to what's called the achievement gap. That is the disparity on the scores on standardized tests and other measures of academic achievement between whites and Asians on one hand and blacks and Hispanics on the other, the achievement gap. The original purpose of the Common Core, grounded in that, has now been largely forgotten. The early supporters of the Common Core realized that to sell it to the general public, they needed a broader marketing message. And ultimately, they seized on the idea that the Common Core would make students 
all students, college and career ready. Now that phrase deserves a grave marker of its own, um, and I'll come back to it with a marble slab and chisel in hand, but let's stay for a moment with the original idea. How was the Common Core supposed to cure the achievement gap? The answer, if you don't already know it, is bound to be a surprise. Coleman and Zimba proposed that the way to eliminate the achievement gap was to set standards so low that everybody could meet them. They announced that in a 2007 white paper for the Carnegie Corporation of New York titled Math and Science Standards That Are Fewer, Clearer, Higher to Raise Achievements at All Levels. Now, fewer, clearer, higher doesn't sound much like lower, lower, lower. So what gives? The title was an early example of what has become the hallmark of common core speak, using words to mean their opposite. It's worth seeing just how Coleman and Zimba accomplished this trapeze act. Part one of three. They decided on what they called pragmatic analysis, which really means don't bother teaching any math that ordinary people won't end up using in their eventual jobs. So when was the last time you used logarithms at work or quadratic equations? Maybe there's some engineers here, I don't know, but that simplifies things. Most of us just don't. Part two. The standard should be chosen, and I quote, to dramatically raise the number and diversity of students performing at the highest levels. Now that one takes a little bit of thinking. The content, in other words, of these standards should not be determined by the intrinsic importance of the material, but by how well it wipes away evidence of demographic disparities. Part three, Coleman and Zimba decided that the word higher in higher standards would not refer to the intellectual content of the standards, but to the percentage of people who passed them. Let me explain that. Since the percentage of people who passed them had to be raised, to raise it meant lowering the standards. Therefore, the phrase in Common Core speak, higher standards, means lower standards. Now, if you understand this, you understand most of what you need to know about the Common Core. The mysteries fall away, sunlight floods in. The Common Core was never intended to raise standards. It was from the get-go a plan to establish a nationwide floor that would also be a ceiling. It was anti-excellence wrapped in the gift wrap and tinsel of excellence. Now, of course, the history of gift wrapping is important, as is the detailed working out of exactly what went into the standards. Coleman and Zimba started with the concept and applied it first to math standards. Then, as time went on, the Common Core split into two parts, two streams of standards, math and the English language arts. I'm going to talk a lot about the English language arts. It went on through a prolonged period of development with the involvement of hundreds of experts in many fields, or at least supposed experts, and it grew not one but two giant bureaucracies of its own, and then it became enmeshed in state and national politics. Now, a lot of that's covered in the book. I'm not going to recapitulate it tonight. Let's go back to the casket. I started by saying Common Core is dead. How did it die? Well. It died of parental opposition. It died of teacher opposition. It died of political defection as state governors who said they were for it changed their minds and went against it. And perhaps most importantly, it died of flat out academic failure. Now the academic failure is the most telling of these. Remember the Common Core was sold to the American people as something that would make high school graduates college and career ready. The designers of the Common Core thought that they could game this by measuring their success according to their own custom-made scales. They forgot about a few things. For example, they forgot about the National Assessment of Educational Progress, an AEP, which provides an independent check on what students are actually learning. 
Any NAEP tests randomly select fourth and eighth graders across the country and examine their performance in reading and math. The liberal Brookings Institution in Washington last month released a study of how NAEP scores line up with the states that went all in for the Common Core, the strong implementers in Brookings speak, and co contrasted those with states that had medium implementers and the states that were non-adopters. Now, there's plenty of data on this. 46 states initially went into the Common Core. Three of them have pulled out to some degree, Indiana, Oklahoma, and South Carolina. A few others have made some ad hoc changes in their versions of the Common Core, but it's still essentially the Common Core. What Brookings found is, quote, no evidence that the Common Core has made much of a difference during a six-year period of stagnant NAEP scores. There is, as Brooklyn also, Brookings also notes, some moderately good news in that finding. The Common Core appears not to be the general cause of stagnation in NAEP scores across the country. Even states that didn't adopt Common Core have seen some declines. So this is a little bit subtle. What's happened with the Common Core is that the scores have declined a lot, but what's happened to the rest of the country without the Common Core is that they've declined a little bit. But that does point to this bigger problem. Let me pause on it for a moment, because the larger context does matter. We have spent, as a nation, many billions of dollars so far on developing and implementing the Common Core and bribing states to join it. One result of that investment is no measurable improvement in the independent test of the NAEP scores. States that spent nothing on the Common Core got better results than states that spent on the Common Core. That does point to the question of why these scores have slumped across the board. What happened during the last six years? Can anybody think of that? Six years of Common Core implementation that way against general performance. Now, I don't want to give a, a flip answer to this. I should say the Common Core's own answer is that the Common Core is so profound a change in the way we educate young people that it will take many, many years before the benefits become clear. The Common Core, according to its proponents, works on deep learning. Well, deep learning is something different from what ordinarily happens in the classroom. It's what we teach today that shows up 18 years later. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, now, Brookings rightly points out that most of the educational reform efforts in the past, both in the United States and elsewhere around the world, get their biggest results in their first one or two years of implementation when people are really fired up about them and then the improvements taper off. But the Common Core isn't going to follow that pattern. It's going to slump the scores, make them lower and lower and lower year by year, and then suddenly they're going to shoot up. Just wait. I don't. Well, the real answer why we're in this decline must surely involve a combination of social and cultural changes that are largely beyond what I can go in here tonight. But we know a few things that strongly erode the performance of children in schools, and they're worth mentioning. The top of the list is single parent families, followed closely by other forms of family dysfunction. Both of these are connected with financial insecurity. Another factor is immigration. Students struggling with English as a second language don't do as well in school as native speakers. Increase single parent families, family dysfunction, financial insecurity, and immigration, and poor school performance will follow as night follows day. Add to this the increasing tax on students' attention from things like social media and the increasing use of schools as a way of promoting ideological conformity, and the picture is not very bright. There's no eureka moment in saying these things. We all know them. The value in reminding ourselves of the obvious is that it gives us the space to recognize the sheer hype of Common Core. Changing the standards for K-12 education was never ever going to change the real level of performance of students. That takes committed parents who have the time and ability to foster in their children a love of learning, 
a desire to succeed, the confidence to push ahead. It takes schools taught by responsible teachers. Good, nutritious meals don't cook themselves. Just because you've created a perfect list of ingredients doesn't mean that you've got a perfect dish. And kids don't suddenly self-educate because bureaucrats have fine-tuned curricular standards and impose them uniformly on the nation. Well, that's not to say that the Common Core is in any manner a fine-tuning of the curriculum. It moves significantly in the opposite direction. There are other indicators besides those NAEP scores that demonstrate this. The SATs and AT ACT scores have also dipped during the Common Core era. Aware of the problem, David Coleman, the inventor of the Common Core, moved to become head of the college board in 2012 with the promise that he would align the SATs with the Common Core. And right now, the fully aligned SATs with the Common Core are being administered. Aligned, of course, is a euphemism. It means dumbed down. The Common Core is desperately in need of evidence that it does some academic good. And if the existing measures won't provide it, they'll create their own. It needs that evidence because more and more data is piling up on the other side. In the English language arts, which I said I'd come back to, and here they are, we are watching the decline of instruction in literature and its replacement by nonfiction. Now, why does that matter? Research on reading skills runs against using nonfiction, or at best fails to support it. But Common Core insists that students learn best from treating everything as buzzword coming, informational texts. That is, even when students read literature, they're supposed to treat it primarily as a source of information. This is a bit like trying to squeeze chocolate milk out of an orange. Now, you might keep trying to do that, but you'd be far better off trying to collect orange juice. Our friends at Brookings wondered whether schools in the states that heavily implemented the Common Core actually went ahead with this switch, nonfiction for fiction. And sure enough, they have. In the years since the Common Core has arrived, both fourth and eighth grade literature has fallen by 10% to be replaced by non-fictional texts. And in the non-adopting states, the trend has been exactly the opposite. Now, should we care about this? Americans, after all, are a practical people. We pride ourselves on that. And the Common Core appeals to our practical side by insisting that it will teach children all the practical skills of garnering information from what they read. Who cares if we can wade through the whale guts in Moby Dick if they can quickly decipher the informational texts on, say, BuzzFeed quizzes? Which Disney princess are you? The truly practical answer is that reading literature is by far the biggest predictor of long-term academic success. Follow Ishmael on the voyage of the Pequod and eventually, for many, he'll land in Silicon Valley or Wall Street. Learn how to excel at BuzzFeed quizzes, and maybe you'll get a job working for the guy who did read Moby Dick in high school. Literature, for a lot of reasons, matters beyond that. It teaches us how to read beyond the literal text, to see analogies, to hear the unspoken, to tease out implications, and to comprehend the whole. Literature is where we learn to see the forest, not just the pine needles. The Common Core is taking us way into pine needle territory. The Common Core's math trajectory is different and arguably even worse. We come back to that. The Common Core language arts has other problems that have not been subjected the way Brookings did to rigorous review, but they're worth mentioning. The Common Core fragments text. It fights against context. Maybe the best example of that is widely circulated is the teaching of the Gettysburg Address without mentioning there was actually a little battle there in Gettysburg and it had something to do with the Civil War. Background knowledge is seen by Common Core proponents as basically white privilege. Kids who have had the privilege of learning about American history bring that into the class, that's an unfair advantage. Common Core wants to level the playing field here. Everybody should be equally ignorant, and therefore we'll start from that. The Common Core f 
fights against context and background knowledge, but then it turns everything into evidence. Evidence is a real common core key word. I've sometimes said that the common core aims to create students who are half robot and half lawyer. If it had its way, the robot lawyers would be the super efficient processors of information in a mechanistic way, and they would face life with this disposition. In common core speak, the standards aim for these benevolent sounding phrases, greater focus on fewer topics. That sounds nice. The common core has put a lot of work into this smooth marketing of something that you neither need nor want. It promises, for example, coherence in the place of what it calls a list of disconnected topics, tricks, and mnemonics. Uh, that list of disconnected topics and tricks is its description of what happened before the Common Core was there. It doesn't much match the education I had, probably not yours either. I take some umbrage at the idea that education used to be just a random jumble of stuff until the Common Core arrived and solved the problem. As with the deceptive attempt to call lower standards higher standards, the translation of greater focus on fewer topics is something like this. Our students will know little, remember less, and never race ahead with mental shortcuts. They will instead plod dutifully ahead according to our method, because that's what robot lawyers do. Of course, I don't believe the Common Core can actually produce these robot lawyers. Very few students will sit still for such a stultifying education. And teachers will, and already have, bridled against it too. In that sense, the Common Core's failure as a curriculum was built in from the start. There never was going to be a day when students would conform to it. Its educational ideals are unmoored from psychological and educational reality. But that doesn't mean it can't do damage. It has enormous opportunity costs for students. Every minute they spend studying the Common Core, they're not something, studying something else that's better. What they could have and should have learned, the Common Core has pushed out of the way. Now, my colleague at the National Association of Scholars, Carol Iannone, examined the teacher's edition of the 11th grade literature textbook, The American Experience Common Core Edition which I would have happily brought with me, but it weighs about 20 pounds. It's two volumes, big monstrous thing. It came out from Prentice Hall. She went through the 500 or so readings in it, and I will quote her words here. She puts it, the blizzard of sidebars and underbars and inserts and various sets of instructions and proposed questions with proposed answers and assessment measures and writing assignments and preparation exercises and background information and thought experiments and group discussion ideas and further task suggestions and more, all in different shapes, sizes, fonts, and colors and groupings. Now remember, Common Core is supposed to be a simplification. Pray tell, what happened to the standards that are fewer, clearer, higher? And what happened, for that matter, to the word and between fewer, clearer, higher? Um, just as higher turned out not to mean higher, and fewer didn't turn out to mean fewer, and clearer certainly didn't turn out to mean clearer, what fewer actually means in common core speak is that there will be fewer differences among the states, since in principle they will all have the same standards. Uh, you may remember uh, Bill Gates saying, why should algebra, algebra be different in Alabama and Alaska? Well, algebra isn't different, but maybe the way we teach it is. The number of standards themselves could actually be quite large, and the interpretations of those standards in the hands of busy publishers with a buck to turn could be enormous. What clearer means in Common Core speak is that everything taught could be and should be pinned to the exact sub, sub, sub standard. And I'm not kidding here. The standards are numerically laid out with part A, B, C, and each one with subparts. As you go through a common core line textbook, you'll find basically every paragraph with a string of codes beside it telling you exactly where that idea fits into the common core. Common Core advocates are furious if you call the Common Core a curriculum. 
They say, no, it's, it's standards. We leave it up to the teachers to develop a curriculum. What in the world is going on with all that alignment down to the sub-sub-sub level? It's a curriculum. There should be no ambiguity at all about what, where a stray idea fits into the palace, the puzzle palace of the common core. The whole thing might be a fantastic mistake, but at least we know where every detail fits into the grand scheme. The result of this kind of clarity, or so-called clarity, is blinding obscurity. For that 11th grade literature textbook, each reading is subject to text complexity multi-index, which combines, bear with me, four comprehensive measures, which expand upon the Common Core State Standards three-part model for measuring text complexity, which in turn combines qualitative and reader task considerations and are balanced with quantitative measures to achieve overall text complexity recommendations. I'm quoting from the Common Core. Got it? <laughs> Many tests. <laughs> Now, all this stuff is applied to readings that look at least superficially worthwhile. Mark Twain is in there, and so is Herman Melville. And lo and behold, the students really are reading Moby Dick. Well, actually, they're reading 18 pages of Moby Dick, pre-digested through the sieve of what they call pre-teaching warm-ups and literary analysis concepts and reading strategy, graphic organizer, transparencies, activating prior knowledge activities, reading strategy prompts and whole armies of other pedagogical concepts because you really cannot trust 11th graders to read 18 pages of Moby Dick. Anything could happen. Melville can be a hard read for students, but burying him between this much apparatus signals to students that he's not only a challenge to be met, he may not even be that, he's an impassable obstacle, and the only way you're going to get past that 18-page excerpt is in a kind of literary hazmat suit. <laughs> the jargon-laden schematization, as Iannone puts it, comes in service of an approach to literature that chops everything into fine pieces and dissolves context. No student will come away from these readings realizing, this is why I read Moby Dick, or anything else. But let's judge the English language arts part of the Common Core by the Common Core's own standards. Is this the sort of thing that is going to make our children college and career ready? Higher education is my business, and I know of no college where this destructive sampling of literature would have any value at all. Higher education is desperate for students who have the trained attention spans and independence of mind to read real books and to frame their own opinions. Students fed on a spoon-fed diet of fragments is exactly what colleges and universities don't want. So how did the Common Core hit on this formula? Well, first, David Coleman and his colleagues appear to have had it in for literature from the start. They wanted nonfiction informational text to be front and center, and if states demanded literature be left in, the common core cogitators decided that literature would have to be stretched and chopped to fit the Procrustean bed of informational texts. But there is something more. Literature is one of those places in the K-12 curriculum where students come into possession of their own civilization. It's where they meet the ideals, values, traditions, and imaginative aspirations of who we are. The very stuff that the Common Core wards off as dangerously privileged or even elitist. So what is education for? Making students college and career ready? That's what the Common Core says. Well, those aren't bad things. But what education is really for is developing character. Without it, children learn nothing. Ideally, students develop as whole people, morally grounded, thoughtful, self-disciplined, creative, hardworking, and mature. We seldom achieve all that, but striving towards it gets us a lot closer than sitting back to see what happens. As the Common Core began to crowd out everything else in schools, an interesting counterpoint began to take shape in the U.S. Department of Education and elsewhere. This is a bit of a digression, but bear with it. 
afraid that the word character might have too much in it for the other side, give too much ground to educational traditionalists. The innovation squads reinvented it as a more tough sounding word. You probably heard it, grit. Now there's a movement in K-12 education to encourage students to develop grit. I don't want to go into it except to say that these grit kickers <laughs> um, are kicking against the moral hollowness of the common core. They aren't saying exactly that, but it's clear that in the fragmented, chaotic world of fewer, clearer, higher standards, there's now a felt need for something that will restore moral agency to students. The robot lawyer model is losing. Or to put it another way, the Common Core is dead and the educrats are now trying to figure out what to do next. Now I spent a lot of time on the English language arts, but the Common Core mathematics standards are troublesome too, just in different ways. First, Common Core mathematics slows down the pace of math instruction. Before Common Core was in place, almost all the states reasonably expected students to master basic addition and subtraction by third grade. Common Core decided fourth grade would do. Same with the multiplication table. Long division was generally a fifth grade skill. Common Core promoted it to sixth grade. Now, these changes may seem small in themselves, but they're large in their cumulative effect. At a time when other nations are racing ahead in STEM education, the US, via the Common Core, decided not to accelerate, but to move into the slow lane. Because math builds on itself, the slowdown in the early stages means slowing down later on. Algebra gets kicked up to ninth grade, when in many states it was being taught in eighth grade. And then the Common Core just tapers off. It has no room at all, for example, for pre-calculus instruction that used to provide the bridge for students headed off to college. Logarithms, since we don't have to worry about those in our careers, are barely mentioned. Parametric equations are absent. Arithmetic series are um, omitted. Polar forms of functions never come up. Of course, most of us adults, we adults, live without these pieces of mathematical knowledge. We studied them once and we moved on to learn other subjects that didn't depend on parametric equations. What's the harm of not teaching them in the first place if we're not going to use them? The harm is that by not providing instruction to young people at an age when they can absorb that knowledge, we preempt the whole possibility of their going further. We're effectively slamming the door shut on millions of children possible careers in the sciences, engineering, and technical fields where a solid foundation in math is crucial. The thinning out of math instruction betrays two key premises of the Common Core's proponents. First, the one I've mentioned several times, that the standards would make students college and career ready. Plainly, they do the opposite in math. They ensure that students who attend schools that rely on the Common Core will not be college ready. They may be career ready if the career they're aiming at is running the automated cash register at a fast food restaurant. That's about it. The other key promise is that the standards would be, new phrase, internationally benchmarked. This means that they would be at least as high as the standards in countries that excel in math. Now last year, the US ranked 28th. That's down a notch from 27th in 2012. The top five nations as far as math and science performance are Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. Finland is sixth, tiny Estonia is seventh, and Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Canada. Only one in four American students does not reach the baseline for mathematical proficiency set by the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, but that makes us roughly comparable to Hungary, Italy, and Lithuania. Plainly, the Common Core has done nothing so far to nudge us upwards in world rankings, let alone make us comparable to the best. So the Common Core's boast that it would set internationally benchmark standards turns out to mean something like, with the aid of binoculars, we can see that bench on the back of that foreign truck disappearing several miles up the road over the horizon. 
Common Core defenders have their excuses for this. The college ready part turned out to be, as one of the Common Core's architects recently confessed, ready for community college. Students who have higher aspirations have to fend for themselves by seeking out tutors or extracurricular supplementary classes if they can find them and if their parents can afford them. Prosperous families will find those workarounds, but for everyone else, Common Core imposes a low ceiling on what their children can learn in school. Math instruction goes astray in some other ways, too. It's infamous with parents for imposing tediously complicated forms of computation on children in primary school. Now, these computations can work. I've played with them. They work um, if you have enough time to make them work. They provide the right answers most of the time. Some of the problems are badly phrased. But they also deliberately drive a wedge between the parent and the child, since very few parents can crack the code. Now, I don't think that's an accident. That's, that's as they say, a feature, not a bug. The common core is meant to drive a wedge between parents and children. It's part of that leveling thing where we want to have centralized, uniform control, and the way to do that is to push the parents out. Common core math standards also diverge from parental understanding in some more subtle ways for reasons known only to the common core's architects and never discussed. They emphasize simple visual models such as number lines in grades one through six. Less easily visualized mathematical concepts like multiplication and division with negative numbers get put off till later, in this case, seventh grade. Common Core approaches geometry in grades five through eight as though it's nothing more than measurement. And then it abruptly turns to the rest of geometry as the study of rigid motions. It's a way of teaching geometry that has been tried once or twice before, once in a uh, school district in Belgium and once in the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Both times it was treated as an experiment and discarded as a failure. Now, why it should be imposed on nearly the whole United States through the Common Core really is a mystery. Uh, I think it has something to do with Jason Zimba, the physics professor at Bennington College, who is David Coleman's best friend, um, who is kind of a quirky guy and thought, hey, here's a neat way to teach geometry that uh, throws Euclid under the bus. Let's give that a try. And in the spirit of free experimentation, let's impose it everywhere all at once on all students so that no one else gets to learn geometry in any other way. Well, that's what we've got. Well, if you sit down and examine the Common Core math standards in detail, you will find that it is a system of instruction that internally makes a certain sense. Like the ling English language arts standards, it works if you grant its underlying premises. And if you want robot lawyers and students frozen into the logic of inefficient and obscure systems of calculation, the Common Core may be just what you're looking for. But if the question is, what kind of people do we want our children to become, the Common Core doesn't give a very satisfying answer. The answer to the extent that it can be inferred from the standards is that the Common Core wants to make children into well-organized utility maximizers, people who do not waste time contemplating hard problems or dreaming big dreams, but who have a ready means to cut things down to size using techniques they already know how to handle. The perfect job for a Common Core graduate is probably coding, and that may be why Bill Gates funded so much of the development and promotion of the Common Core, not because he cynically wanted legions of ready-to-wear programmers, but because he really does think that the best of all possible career paths is writing computer programs. Common Core is, to be sure, on its way out. It is unloved by parents, teachers, and the public as a whole. Designed to reform how schools teach English and math, it demoted other crucial subjects such as history. So what lies ahead for all of us is partly repair and partly restoration. Now, I've simplified this story for sure. I've said nothing about how the Common Core traveled from a pet project of some state governors to being one of President Obama's signature projects. 
I've said nothing about the dubious constitutional and statutory standing of the Common Core. I've passed over the ruckus over data mining. I've left the disastrous rollout of the tests by two multi-state testing consortia fall by the wayside. I've passed over in silence the duplicity that characterized parts of the Common Core movement and the self-delusion of the advocates who mistook Common Core for Hirsch's core knowledge. The project sprawls in more directions than I can possibly cover in one talk, but it probably doesn't matter because the Common Core truly is dead. No state that doesn't already have it will adopt it at this point. Nearly every state that has adopted it is trying to figure out a way to get out of it or at least to ameliorate its worst features at the lowest possible political and financial costs. Major supporters, governors, foundations, think tanks have bailed, some ruefully. If only, they say, if only we'd done this or that. Of course, every movement has its diehard partisans. Here in Illinois, you've got your share of them. No doubt there are some common core idioms who imagine that there will be a resurrection, but dead is dead. And the real answers, questions we're confronted with now are those that follow an earthquake or a hurricane. How will we clean up this mess? Who will pay for it? What comes next? America has invested so much in common core that we can't easily get out of it. The investments, and that's a nice irony in its own thing because when Common Core was being sold, it was going to be virtually costless. That is, uh, schools are always turning over their textbooks and developing new materials. The cost of Common Core would just be absorbed in the stream of things that came along. Now, if a state tries to get out of Common Core, there are these very severe warnings that the exit costs are in the hundreds of millions. We can't afford to get out. Little contradiction there. Well, the investments do include very large amounts spent on textbooks like the one I described, computers to support the Common Core tests, which are all automated, the teacher training. There are also poignant questions for the parents who now have the choice of waiting out the bad years ahead by moving their children out of public schools or staying put knowing that they will have to work extra hard to, at home to compensate for Common Core's poor delivery of essential knowledge and the mischanneling of students' intellectual development. Now, I don't have an easy answer to those questions. Homeschooling isn't the answer for everybody. I don't have an easy answer in part because I'm forced to focus on mitigating the upstream damage to higher education, which itself is going to be considerable. One of those battles is right at hand. I'm fighting the continuing efforts of the College Board under David Coleman's stewardship to institutionalize the Common Core's principles as part of the SATs and the advanced placement exams. Uh, last year was one of the big battles over the uh, AP US history standards, for example, which are still a mess. But that's a topic for another day. Let me say a last word about the other Davids in the fight against the Common Core, not the David Coleman's. This was an enormously well-funded and politically wired effort to capture American schools, in effect to wrest power from parents, local school districts in the states, and to transfer it to private testing consortia, publishers, and the federal government. It failed because a handful of small institutes and grassroots activists took a stand. The Pioneer Institute, which published Drilling Through the Core and many other papers, the Heartland Institute, which week after week, month after month, stayed on the story, the American Principles Project, the Eagle Forum, the Cato Institute, the Constitutional Coalition, and many of the other Davids I speak of. The Goliath of Common Core lies comatose on the ground today because of what they did, what you did. And I'm sure many of the people in this room played a larger role than I did. If any good comes from this sorry episode of misguided reform of our schools, it will be this, this proof that we can successfully stand up to the follies pushed on us by schemers who do not have the best interests of our children and our communities at heart. Thank you. All right, Peter, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we do have time for some Q&A session uh, before Peter does a book signing in the back. 
I will make one comment that uh, turning kids into robot lawyers sounds like a terrifying plot of a movie. <laughs> but <laughs> I was a, a math major in college, and I do understand logarithms, and I wasn't very good at English, but you get a double A plus in sarcasm. Thank you. <laughs> I majored in it. I can probably guess the answer to my question, but can you tell me something about the whole funding experience of this thing going back to early 2000s and just where'd they get their money from to right. do all this, put this um, all together? The seed money came from the Gates Foundation. Um, uh, David Coleman was a Rhodes Scholar, came back to the U.S., tried to get a job as a teacher, couldn't, so he, he's the, he was the son of the president of Bennington College, so he had some connections. He created his own little foundation and brought some friends into it. They pitched uh, Bill Gates. Not all of us can walk into Bill Gates' office. He could. Um, he got the seed money for it, the uh, uh, initial white paper that he wrote with Jason Zimba on the math standards was part of that. Um, there was a fair amount of, I'd have to call it brilliance in thinking this thing through. They realized that earlier efforts to capture American schools through the instruments of the federal government uh, came a cropper because of constitutional problems. Our constitution just happens to leave education to the states. And that had been ratified over and over again um, by Congress in passing bills that said the federal government's not going to set a curriculum. So that was this big problem that a lot of activist education reformers wanted the Department of Education to move in and do this, but it couldn't. So the, the solution that they came up with was to pitch the National Governors Association. This happened in uh, early 2008, I believe, uh, with the idea that if we can get each state simultaneously to adopt this, we won't need to take it to the federal government. We will have a de facto national system. So uh, uh, Coleman recruited uh, the head of the National Governors Association. Uh, I should say that's not a governmental body. That's a private group. Not all the members of it are uh, governors or ex-governors, but many of them are. Um, uh, politicians looking for a, uh, a quick fix or a, a political shot in the arm, a program that they could adopt. Uh, got sold on this thing, and uh, they pitched it to a second organization called the uh, uh, sorry, Chief State School Officers, I'm missing a word of that, um, that uh, went in with the National Governors Association. Now, you're asking about the finances of this. There was Gates money in it all along. Um, at last count, which was for me about three years ago, uh, Bill Gates had put $250 million into it. That's not a huge amount of money by government standards, but with no other players in the game, you can do quite a bit with $250 million. So the DEA does not have a big footprint in that? Oh, it, it, it did, because if I continue the story, the story I didn't tell here, is that uh, something happened in the fall of 2008. We had a uh, a rather uh, rocky time financially, and the states were hard hit. The uh, Congress, before President Obama took office, passed the stimulus bill. Uh, President Obama, newly installed, uh, began to speak of shovel-ready projects that uh, uh, would be the right place to invest that uh, huge amount of money Congress had come up with. The trouble was there really were no shovel-ready projects. Uh, but Arnie Duncan, the new Secretary of Education, I sort of imagine him putting his hand up at a cabinet meeting and say, Barack, I got an idea. Uh, this Common Core thing, we can, we can shovel in a lot of money there. So uh, thus was born in early 2009 what became known as the Race to the Top. The Race to the Top was a pinata that's stuffed with several billion dollars and the states were told you have a short deadline here to say that you are going to adopt education reforms that fit the following criteria. 
Now, those criteria didn't say the common core, but they were extracted from the common core so that the only thing that could possibly fit them was the common core. If the state agreed to adopt the common core, it got a ticket, essentially, to the lottery. Uh, 14 states, I'm a little fuzzy on the number, 13 or 14 states ultimately were awarded a portion of the money that made up the race to the top funds. Uh, but every state that t was thinking about it was tempted. 46 of them signed up. Uh, a few, like Texas, took a look at it and said, no, thank you. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the states were cajoled and bribed to come into this. Now, it was at the point at which um, the uh, race to the top moved in that it ceased to be, even in a superficial way, a state-led project. The official name for the Common Core is the Common Core State Standards, CCSS. Um, so the uh, proponents of it to this day will insist, oh, it's just a state project. The federal government's been helpful, yes, but it's in the, But no, the federal government at that point had the, the whip hand on this, as we found out when a few states started uh, thinking, well, we didn't win the race to the top. Now we're stuck with spending a billion, a couple billion dollars implementing a program we don't really want, and which in fact hasn't even been written. Maybe we will back out. At that point, the Department of Education said, uh, no, this is a one-way street. You're in, you're in. Um, you want to get out? Remember that thing called No Child Left Behind, which said that by 2013, you have to have 100% of your students scoring at an acceptable level in math and English. An impossibility to begin with, no state was going to make it, so the Department of Education invented something called a No Child Left Behind waiver. Said, if you haven't made those standards, we won't punish you, we'll give you a waiver, as long as you're with us on Common Core. Think, thinking twice about the Common Core, we're thinking twice about the waivers. Um, without the waiver, the states were in jeopardy of losing lots of other federal money flowing into other educational programs. So the thuggery of uh, the federal government very quickly came into play. So. Money is the root of all evil here, but it starts with Bill Gates's money. I should say, um, Bill missed a great opportunity. I mean, long before I took an active interest in fighting the Common Core, I was sitting there with all kinds of plans for reforming American education and watching allied organizations uh, one by one endorse the Common Core. I think, well, what in the world is going on? Why are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And I said, oh, they're getting big grants from the Gates Foundation. He forgot about me. Hi. Oh. That, that terrifies, too. Well, for sure, Americans have made a mess out of schooling for a long, long time. And depending on how far you want to scroll back through our history, it's something that we as a people have never been especially good at. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't make it worse. And we have certainly spent the last century, the era of progressive reform in education, making it worse. Uh, we have schools of education that seem to be specialized in training teachers to do terrible jobs. And uh, we have state bureaucracies that work hand in glove with the uh, schools of education. All those problems long predate the Common Core. Now, I know David Coleman. Um, I know him because he's taken the trouble to seek me out and uh, try to persuade me things aren't so bad. He's a charming guy. I can see how persuasive he could be in these private meetings. But when he talks about how bad the schools were before the Common Core, he strikes a chord with me. I mean, I know they were bad. And um, 
is the answer more local control? Well, local control sometimes works. Federal control never works. So I can give you that much of an answer. But as I said, I don't really have a solution to this. I think school choice improves the odds that any given child is going to get a good education. But if you really care about the education of children, we should be mostly worried about the breakdown of family in this country. Uh, Two-parent families make a gigantic difference in the performance of children. Fighting against the dysfunction and the various forms of brand new dysfunction that we're entering into every week, it seems, uh, seem to me where the fight really needs to go. We cannot solve this problem overnight. It's not something that is amenable to these quick fixes. And one thing about the Common Core was that there may have been some good ideas there initially, but trying to impose them all at once by fiat on the whole country has been just an out and out disaster. Well, well, that's going to replace it. I mean, of course, a, a president can't do that, and that the Common Core is now instantiated in law in all these different states. And a president could probably direct the uh, Department of Education to uh, cease and desist the efforts to lock everybody into the Common Core, but he can't make it go away. Right. So that's, that's just rhetoric. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, this is very much uh, the same question I have. And I'm concerned about uh, perceiving Common Core as the target by itself. Mm -hmm. That uh, as though this was a discreet, undesirable thing and all we have to do is get rid of it. When in fact all it is is sort of the congealed embodiment of things that have been going on in schools for some time. The philosophy and practices that have been sneaking into schools under the rubric of constructivism mm -hmm. for quite a long time. Getting rid of Common Core isn't going to turn around the Mag Modern Language Association's attack on English, mm -hmm. and it certainly isn't going to correct uh, the pervasiveness of constructivist math. Um, in, sh in this area, uh, virtually every child in the Chicago public school system is taught with constructivist math, math. and the last I looked, which was some five, six years ago, some 76% of the districts in the suburbs were using constructivist math. So the problem isn't just getting rid of, as you ask, what do you replace it with? What we, what we would replace it with is what was already there, and that wasn't working. So my concern is if we simply say that the problem is constructivist math, mm -hmm. that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is constructivism. Well, I, I largely agree with that. Um, it, it's uh, sort of one thing at a time. Right now, uh, we're dealing with a uh, an institutionalized reform that uh, recapitulates, embodies, carries forward a lot of bad ideas that were already in circulation. But there is this difference, which is that to the extent that uh, American education had some degree of freedom to experiment its way out of the follies of the past, uh, that has been taken away uh, with a one-size-fits-all thing. The experimental age would be written off and concluded if we contented ourselves with the Common Core. So taking away the Common Core doesn't solve all of our problems by any means, but I think it's a necessary, if not sufficient, step. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question from online. I do see a lot of hands popping up. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to everyone, but like I said, Peter will be signing books in the back. Uh, this is from uh, Larry Greenberg, who actually sent quite a few questions. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, he says, I am a proponent of high standards and prefer local control in almost all things, but is this a paradox in our federal system? Um, I'm not sure that I see a paradox in it, in that um, high standards can be rooted in something other than federal fiat. Uh, we can have high standards in uh, uh, ballet or classical music or uh, almost any other field without some federal agency telling us 
uh, have you checked all these boxes, have you done it our way? Likewise, in education, uh, higher standards are notoriously hard to pin down, but we know them when we see them. Um, we expect our students to embrace difficulty, not unreasonable difficulty, but the kind of difficulty that can be met and overcome. And um, standards have something to do with setting the bar at a place where we help students grow rather than simply meet them where they are. Um, so I don't see a, uh, a paradox there. Okay. I think that local communities oftentimes are more sensitive to the capacity of students to stretch than are people sitting in uh, air-conditioned offices on DuPont Circle. Um, Excellent, thank you. Um, I was a high school teacher for 37 years. And what's so depressing about all of this is it's another example of how susceptible American education is to the latest wave of so-called reform. Mm -hmm. Every few years, a new group of administrators would come into my high school district, and there was a new way of teaching, a new way of handling all of this. Mm -hmm. So you went through it, and then they left, and then another group came in. And uh, it's uh, all the same. There's a new way of reinventing the wheel. There's a new way of re-educating or educating the American people. And uh, I don't see an end to this unless you give. I finally come to the conclusion, you have to give parents a choice of where they want to send their children to school so they can avoid this. Mm -hmm. As long as you're sending your kids to a centrally controlled public school system, whether it's local, state, or whatever, you're going to be stuck with this unless you have a choice. We don't want to have the same car. We don't want to have the same kind of house. But as long as we have one government-controlled education system, you're going to be stuck with this over and over and over again. It's not going to stop. I agree. <laughs> Perfect. Um, going back to the issue of uh, the feds imposing their will via money, mm -hmm. um, what are the implications of the bill that was signed that the public press said basically undid the No Child Left Behind Act? Um, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, I have been reading a little bit about it. My impression is that uh, it's mostly camouflage, that the Common Core is uh, uh, not going away. The, the new uh, acts passed in, uh, well, the, the last one in December of 2015, uh, are a ratification of the status quo, although there's some rhetoric thrown in to make them look like something is changing. Um, Peter, I didn't know you were involved in the sustainability um, papers, NAS, which were excellent. I would, you know, we're climate change here and they were just outstanding. Um, how do we ensure that Common Core dies um, and is buried six feet under. Other than, you know, talks like this in your book, we need to really continue to put the heat on. Well, um, as I was saying at the end of my talk, um, I think grassroots activism really does work. Uh, it has had to face a, uh, a pretty bleak period in the last several years of uh, repression by the IRS and uh, uh, other instruments of government. Um, we are now also faced with uh, another topic that is dear to me, which is the corralling of a whole generation of college students into uh, enthusiasm for socialism and for uh, ending free speech and free inquiry. Uh, so we have some pretty hefty problems to uh, tackle with this, but certainly the answer to any of these problems begins with getting our uh, message right with children at a young age, uh, children who have grown up long after the end of the Cold War and who now see nothing amiss with the promises of uh, Karl Marx's vision of a perfect society, have been neglected in some 
sense. And it's easy to see how that happens and why keep fighting the Cold War when it's long over. Well, now we see the answer why. Uh, the, uh, the fight for the sorts of values of freedom and civic responsibility that I hear implied at least in most of these questions uh, is one that uh, we work on through small meetings like this uh, and each of us has a sort of mission to go out and talk to others. Uh, a lot of us are writers on this thing and the, the written word, the spoken word have uh, a much more profound effect than we sometimes think and um, surely the handful, relative handful of people who've fought against the Common Core uh, have created something uh, astonishing. What, what must Jeb Bush think? And I don't want to say that Jeb Bush was brought low only by the Common Core, but I actually do think it was a major factor in the faltering, faltering of a campaign that a year ago everybody thought was a slam dunk to the White House. Uh, it's us. We did that. Uh, where's Chris Christie these days? Uh, the governors who supported the Common Core, uh, with the exception of uh, John Kasich, have all dropped by the wayside in this presidential race, uh, and Kasich isn't doing so well. Uh, that, uh, that represents a, a referendum on the part of the American people about one policy issue. Uh, for me, uh, the, the National Association of Scholars, we've been an organization deeply devoted to uh, trying to preserve what's left of the tradition of teaching Western civilization and the ideals of ordered liberty. Um, this is our moment because for years of crying in the wilderness, trying to awaken conservatives, libertarians, anybody who isn't on the far left, that there's a problem here and what's going on in our colleges. Well, now when um, the uh, house master at Yale University is mobbed by bullies screaming obscenities at him and the president and the chancellor of the University of Missouri are forced to resign uh, and students occupy the president's office at uh, uh, Princeton and the president of uh, Claremont College so cowers that he invites the, invites the students to occupy his office. That stuff is resonating with a very broad public. Um, suddenly we're aware that higher education is not something that can just be written off as a folly that young people will outgrow. That it really does matter what gets taught. Uh, you mentioned global warming and sustainability and things like that. Uh, our last big report from the National Association of Scholars was on the fossil fuel divestment movement. Um, and my uh, associate, Rochelle Peterson, who uh, a young college graduate who looks the part, was able to go into the meetings of divestment activists, not deceptively, she just showed up. But they accepted her as such. And we were able to sort of be at the table hearing about these people whose dearest wish is to bring down uh, the fossil fuel-based economy. Uh, the leaders of the movement speak openly about the need to destroy capitalism because capitalism is the great enemy. Um, they are uh, a highly successful movement in mobilizing college students across the country by the tens of thousands. Uh, this is not something that you can shrug off. It has a difference, or it makes a difference. If we end up with, uh, as we now have 20 govern uh, uh, 20, the attorneys general in 20 states, led first by New York and California, are trying to prosecute Exxon. Um, why? Because a bunch of these student bullies essentially said, Exxon, back in the 1980s, knew that global warming was happening, um, and they hid that knowledge to inflate their profits, but we know they knew it was happening because they raised the level of their oil platforms offshore, knowing that the levels of the sea would rise. Uh, so on the basis of that evidence, we need to throw the executives of ExxonMobil into jail and fine them billions of dollars. Um, 
Exxon's not going to walk away from this scot-free. They will end up paying big fines or big amounts of money just to get out of the lawsuit. And you and I will be paying for that. Um, so what happens on campus, unlike Las Vegas, doesn't just stay there. <laughs> uh, what's happening on campus is going to affect us all, and in many more ways than you think. Uh, if we end up with President Sanders, it's going to be because of college students. All right, excellent. We only have time for a couple quick questions. So uh, if you have a question I didn't get to, I'm sorry. Joe, that's for you too. <laughs> I'm very heartened to learn that Common Core is dead. Um, also kind of heartened that it was kind of the people who did it. Um, Diane Ravitch, before she was in favor of Common Core, she wrote a book about educational reform movements through the 20th century. Yes, it's, which great, was it's a really good book. Yeah. Right, very good book, and it, it kind of points out that it was always the families finding out that their children didn't know what they had learned mm -hmm. and make, in demanding that ch things change. Mm -hmm. But this, was, this, this also happened at the college level with the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. you know, I, taught, I taught at the college level for 25 years, and I had to dumb down my program my, mm -hmm. my, my curriculum every you know every few years because the students coming in weren't ready yep. shorten essays that sort of thing so I, I can't imagine I'm not teaching at the moment but um, we know what breaks these kinds of movements I guess we don't know what happens when we what what, what we can replace them with and I don't think it should be a top-down kind of thing okay. you know maybe National Association of Scholars and Heartland Institute should promote Khan Academy or something like that. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts would oh. be on that. A lot of people don't know what that is. My nephews don't know what it is. <laughs> Khan, Aca Khan Academy is a, a good thing. I'm, I'm not going to particularly give a plug for it so much as I am going to give a plug for the idea of educational diversity. We should be trying a lot of things, finding out what works. Uh, these, the, the kind of movement that sweeps through and that everybody wants it all at once and turns out to be just the, the latest thing and goes away is uh, you know, <laughs> that. Um, uh, as for the... Uh, How do we promote that diversity? Can I, hmm. you know, 20 years ago, uh, well, 40 years ago, uh, President Nixon imposed the 55 mile an hour speed limit on hmm. The way he imposed it was you got federal money if you brought in so many tickets for speeding on the highway. Well, it seems like Common Core is, you know, you get, you know, no child left behind, you got money. If you did certain things, Common Core, you get money if you do certain things. Or you lose money if you try to get out of it. And you lose money if you try to get out of it. What if something like that was done by, I, I assume something like that could be done by a future president. Yes. Untie the threat from the funding. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a good step. Those of us who favor freedom always have the hard case to make that the most important thing to do is to uh, eliminate the threats to freedom. And uh, that's, that doesn't sound like the instant policy solution, but it really is the, the way we need to go. I, I'm glad you mentioned the GI Bill. I'd go back even to the Civil War and the passage of the Morrell Act, which was, uh, the, that's, that created land-grant universities and was uh, our first step towards mass higher education and low standards. The Morrell Act specified that higher education was going to be for training people to be better farmers and better mechanics, and the rest of education could go to the wall. Um, just real quick, the, so I'm, I'm going to try to offer a solution. I'm going to see what you think of the solution because hmm. um, I'm, I'm skeptical the Common Core is dead um, based on the uh, last question I just heard. I, I kind of see it as no matter what you try to do to it, it keeps on coming back um, in some form. And this is probably because, you know, I'll just try and go through this really quickly. First of all, I see the district-based school system as already more of a McDonald's franchise system than anything, and Common Core is merely the last step. Second, everybody in this room knows that we need to develop something. If we're going to have something to put, uh, get rid of the Common Core, we have to come up with something that's better than the Common Core. Mm -hmm. The next thing we have to do is we have to make sure that people can know that. 
and know what it is and know what being better than the Common Core is. And I think that the book that you wrote is and, and put together is an excellent step in that direction. Next thing is, we mentioned Khan. And Khan comes with full curriculum, full dashboard, and, and com including testing. So everything, here's my theory. Everything is already in place to simply have citizens and children and parents circumvent the Common Core simply by walking away from the district system and producing something better. The one last piece, and this is something where the free market movement can really help, a lot of state think tanks, a lot of think tanks like Heartland working together, um, to and, and perhaps even working with their donor base to create almost a, a, a network of what would be something that superseded Common Core. And then you step away from the testing and you step away from PARC and SBAC and you go to badging. Mm -hmm. And you essentially produce badges that say this badge meets or exceeds Common Core standards with a classical core or a capitalist core or whatever you want to call it. And then you simply start telling people, because this is my position, everything that is already out there. I just came back from a homeschool convention with Lenny, where I spoke about your book and how to stop the Common Core. Everything that we need to su supersede and circumvent the Common Core is already out there. And we just need to start taking action on it. And then we need to start telling people they can leave. So we have to stop pretending that we can fix the existing system. And we need to persuade more and more people Critical mass might be 15 to 17 percent of the student base, and we're already at 4 percent or 3 percent with homeschoolers and 10 percent. So I'd, I'd really quickly like to ask what your op opinion on how that might work and what the free market movement can do to simply build the network that simply allows people to step past the Common Core. Well, I think that was very well said. Um, uh, usually when people talk about tipping points, about 15% seems to be what it takes. And um, I do know that there are viable alternatives for people who see the exit sign and, and go to the exits, but it's a, it's a bold decision for people to take and a hard one. Uh, so I don't underestimate the difficulty of going from 3 or 4% to 15% of people uh, opting out of our schools, and there's there's cultural reasons for that. Uh, parents look back on their schools as a time when uh, they had fun. They expect their kids want that too. Parents don't necessarily want their teenage kids underfoot at home and so forth. The online education badging thing requires a certain entrepreneurial spirit on the part of the parents as well as the children. Uh, and that is not something that is in great supply in America today, the America of uh, people demanding safe spaces and uh, cringing at uh, uh, words or ideas that uh, irritate them. Um, so I think that's the right answer that you're suggesting, but how we get there is going to require every bit of our persuasive talent that we can muster. And I know that's not much of an answer to your point, but uh, it's the best I can do. OK, I've got a couple of things here before we close. Um, on the table, my card. Um, I think the gentleman here asked about more about the history of Common Core. On here, there, well, of which you visit our website, heartland.org, and search on national standards and, co and Common Core. It's actually the link is on here common-core-history. It'll kind of go through a lot more and show you a lot more. Uh, one thing that um, I did in my research when I was looking at this, Texas didn't actually, didn't actually accept Common Core, not because they were scared of it. They actually helped write it. The whole part of C-Scope, um, David Coleman and Bill Gates were down there actually helping and starting to pre-do pre some of the stuff before they started naming it Common Core. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Learn something every day. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, also, remember, our stuff on the table, please feel free to take it, pick it up. If you know some teachers and stuff, please talk to it. Give them a copy of the rewards book. Um, private schools, if they are interested in actually having Joe actually come and talk about rewards, we can work on setting that up. If you need a speaker at an event, feel free to contact us. 
Over here on the table to the left, there's some more information, some more things that Heartland does. Please take a look at it. And people online, thank you as well for watching. And make sure you visit our website, heartland.org. We have a daily podcast. We have our blog. There's a lot of information there. There's a lot of books. There's a lot of publications that Heartland does. And one quick, quick thing I wanted to announce here, another ally we have this Friday night at Stone Church in Orland Park. Duke Pesto will there be there actually talking about Common Core as well. His take is a little different and how he comes about it, about it. He uses a lot of the language from the left, how it kind of did and quotes from them and how they brought Common Core into being and stuff as well there. And you can get a little bit more different take on and different perspective on Common Core as well. There, I want to thank Peter for being here again. Let's all give him a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, let me, uh, one last comment. Um, okay. Uh, Lenny, thank you and thank the Heartland Institute. I'm going to be a bad guest now. I know the Heartland Institute uh, <laughs> has its own uh, 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 fish to fry in these things, but the National Association of Scholars, as I said, is mainly an organization of college professors, but I changed the rules a few years ago. It's now open to anybody who agrees with us, and uh, <laughs> it's a cheap thing to belong to. We, our dues are $75 a year and cheaper if you're retired, and for that you get our splendid quarterly journal, Academic Questions. We're nobody near as prolific as uh, the Heartland <laughs> Institute, but every word we put down is chiseled in stone, and you should enjoy that. So. Yes, and please, uh, Peter will be in the back if you need to uh, have him sign a book, autograph a book. The books are $10, and Peter will be back there. And if you have any more questions, ask Peter. If you have questions about Heartland, make sure you find a staff member and ask us. And f the forms on the table, remember to sign those. And if you want to donate to Heartland, right there on the back, it has everything you need to be able to donate or see Gwen right here as well. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm.